was really important in this work. I really wanted to capture that emotional draw. That that what what does it mean to be traumatized? What does it mean to be terrorized? And um, and so I kept kind of going back to that, and it was it was um, it was difficult to to write, and so it took me quite a long time to write the book. Um, the, um, Excuse me, could you speak just a little louder? Sure, oh. sure. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, I wanted to write this poem, but I found that it was really impossible. And I started to really envy photographers because with photography, it sort of seemed like a photographer could take a picture and that would say the whole thing, or a painter could paint a picture and that would say it. And with poetry, I just felt like, how can I possibly? Um, really respond to the events of my time, which um, I think that 9-11 is probably the event of my generation. I know that um, people who are somewhat older will recall when Kennedy was shot in the same way. And for me, in my generation, it's sort of like, where were you on that day? And everyone had a story to tell. So I sort of thought, well, what's my story? What do I want to say about this? And the only way that I could do it was through a conceptualization about time. Um, I, I was just listening to your conversation before, and, and I think, you know, we all sort of remember where we were that day. And it's true, it was a beautiful day. It was an absolutely gorgeous day that morning, that Tuesday morning. Um, and we had really no idea what was going to happen, right? So, in hindsight, when the 9-11 Commission came out with their report, there, was, there were a lot of warnings. But to us, it sort of felt like there were no warnings at all. And so I thought maybe I'd start with Jean Kemper's poem called Storm Morning. The calm before the deluge, the lips curled before the raging, the weaving driver before the crash, the rumble before the eruption, the ocean's rapid receding before the tsunami, the trip before the fall. A tremendous amount of research went into the book. Um, in the, in the uh, text itself, there's a conceptualization using the scientific principle of the powers of ten. And this became a very important way for me to conceptualize what vantage point each speaker is coming at. So uh, you can sort of imagine the towers, let's say, on the cover. And then some of the speakers are right there, at, say 100 feet away or 1,000 feet away, and some of the speakers are moving out further and further into space. So we kind of imagine that. Um, for example, 10 to the power of 15 is 25 million miles away from ground zero. So one of the poems is not sort of speaking from that perspective. But the, the idea for me was to freeze time. I felt that as time was progressing, that day kept, it kept coming back to me. And it was in the media, and we all saw it on television. But I wanted to stop time and say, wait a minute, what is happening right now? So that's kind of what happens with the book. It freezes this moment. This is where I went back to. Um, and it would be... Technically, it would be September 11th at 9.02.54 a.m. And the United Airlines Flight 175 has just struck the South Tower. And it's, um, it was going at a speed of 500 miles an hour. And this is where the book begins. 10 to the power of zero. Memories. We rebound in necessity for mind and body around these companions. Our wants of our sand, stone by stone, these buildings. What they represent extends and separates the problem into two parts. Disorder increases with time, and desire complicates space.
So now we're at 10 to the power of 2. This is called tower. A sound teems beyond and rings New York Ma Bell's antenna. Its echo and clatter accelerates into peals of clouds. The sound strikes the air at 200 meters above sea level. Sound agitates, splits, one cell, dos bricks, and three steel beams. In two degrees, that is two spatial points, or two slight measures of separation, two blocks of space. He lives, she dies. Within these two degrees, the facade, the once upon a time, two had risen up, twins. Ay, Dios mio, one falls. So moving out, a little further out into space. Ten to the power of four. This is a, a self-elegy. In the winter, I breathe chilly northern air. Under the water, I always held my breath. I consumed the earth of all it offered. I unfroze the fatherland with my own fierce breath. Bury me in the dunes of wild Long Island. Fill my mouth with shells and seaweed, or matches and driftwood, no matter. Place me on the ship destined for a vast and hallowed nothing. Noting matter, I will reside within the nebula beyond the known space. And this is 10 to the power of 5 command center. So you remember that, right? They set up a command center, and I was sort of thinking about that. What, what was that like? Beyond the fenced-in courtyard where rows of monks in saffron robes meditate, the chain-linked fence forms a mosaic skein in front of their faces. I find myself in the command center, and I hear men's voices chanting the Ramayana. It is impossible to understand. I have so many questions. Have I died? Is this the soundtrack of your heaven or mine? Sanskrit chants. If I speak, I would be lying. I might break through the death mask, break through these made-up cages, busted out and jacked up card tables, or I might sit by the side of the road in the rubble. You might enjoy a sixth grade story. A girl with the same glasses as mine smacked my face, took my lunch bag, and called me honky. I didn't understand, but I knew she was angry enough to hurt me. What makes one a New Yorker? You couldn't understand if you hadn't grown up in the shadow of these towering giants. You, my friend, you chose this place, but we did not. We belong here. Unless you've uttered the words, I'll slap that black right out of your skin. You don't own this place. Okay. So after this, we kind of keep moving out into space. Most of those poems were still sort of centered in New York. Now I'm getting much further out. Um, I go to Seattle. And then uh, I go a little further out. So this one is pass. This is 10 to the 17th. The paths. The galaxy from 12 million kilometers looks as though it has no wanderers. And the dialectic continues. Let's consider the infinite. If one adds more stars to any one region of the galaxy, they will collapse in on themselves. Every body moves in space and time, but only in small paths. Immanuel Kant 
observed. The only way of avoiding dogma is to imagine that God created the universe anytime in the past or future. get a lot more meditative as I'm going out into outer space, sort of thinking about being further and further away. And I thought I would read, uh, this one is one of my favorites. Oh, um, and also, we have the original manuscripts in the, um, in the book itself, because I wrote on uh, these big giant pieces of paper. I was sort of writing on a scroll as I was preparing this. So these are, there's some images of that in here. But I was just thinking about being further and further away from what was happening. And I think my motivation, and, and, and just to contextualize a little bit, is that I was really trying to figure out why this happened. It was very ambitious, right? So I was sort of thinking, why would this happen? Why would this happen? And I started to think, well, Maybe if there's a higher consciousness, maybe if I were to understand the whole universe. So I kept kind of placing myself further and further out into the universe. And this one is very close to Jupiter. It's 10 to the power of 14. Spheres of Jupiter's moons. In this accurate system we developed for predicting the positions of heavenly bodies in the sky, Copernicus first claimed Everything did not necessarily have to orbit around the Earth. He was labeled heretic. Then he found the rings around Jupiter, and he reasoned a science and a God did not have to contradict. What is the accuracy of anybody in the sky? Would we, according to the laws of physics, have an infinite model to measure the whole universe? Such gravity may cause an object to fall to the ground. <coughs> and then we go all the way out to the edge of the known universe. So we're all the way out there, past the past the Hubble, you know, sort of way beyond what we can even conceive of. And this is um, a very short poem, um, and um, again, it's a, a little more meditative rather than sort of realistic or pragmatic in any way. Ten to the twenty-fifth power. My cup runneth over. On the event horizon, two specks of light at ten million years of light intimately shine, shine shine. Essentially the book uh, locks the eye, right? So you're looking at the towers, but from different perspectives. So we're kind of going back in to uh, 10 to the power of 10, and this is called skin. Oh, I should say, there was a documentary uh, about the women that take the same ferry from Staten Island every morning. And, and there was a very, I don't know if anybody saw this documentary, but it was really neat. It was all these women that go into work and they go into the bathroom and they're all going to their jobs in lower Manhattan. And so for them, that, that um, September 11th event was really traumatic. They, they lost friends, they lost family members. And, but there's this great documentary of them in the bathroom, and they know everything about each other's lives. I think the ferry ride is something like 22 minutes long, and over the years, they've all gotten to know each other, and so this poem is written about them. This is called Skin. She applied her makeup every morning on the ferry. She dusted, painted, powdered, glossed herself to become one of the beautiful. We know New Yorkers. By the time she reached the office door, she had her body together, her skin closely knit to her torso, a piece of gum in her mouth. When the heat of the bodies on the street reached that maximum limit, 
She bought a bottle of water, put her purse over her shoulder. She never made eye contact with anyone. This would be a direct violation of skin contracts. Okay, so that's kind of the, the positive side of space. So we're thinking about the materialized space that we're mostly familiar with, you know, looking at the universe. Then I uh, started to go into negative space. And this is where, if you think of it in terms of size, everything's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until we're kind of looking at the atom cracked open and talking about physics and quarks. Um, and uh, these are much more meditative in nature. And I, I hesitate to read them because, um, well, I don't know, I just do. <laughs> but, uh, so, the second half of the book is negative space. So thinking about things getting tinier. So, if we're frozen on the towers, we're sort of locking in on smaller and smaller pieces, right? Ten to the negative one, counting to infinity. I want to say yes, yes, I see that my hands break from a steady certainty with which I dial the telephone or call the world book. One universe, one race of humans. See how every measurement of the one zero plus the one zero language moves to outer space 10 times 10 times 10. No, I miss the steady and sure diameter, the one within I call out, push out into silence after silence, two and two times to stand stock still. Ten to the negative two. Color perception. All of us, humans and anything living, divide up from a rock pile. Every single family has at its center a core, a nucleus. These impressions roll and unroll the scrolls. From the core, some with a magenta humanity, others with a velvet revolution. Yet one human life contains more cells than stars in the galaxy. Okay, smaller and smaller. 10 to the negative 3. Angstrom for me. Angstrom, noun, 1, a unit of length equal to 1 ten billionth of a meter. From this distance, the green view centers, and the atom looks like a map of Central Park, a once controlled, burned native forest. The masses of green amble the avenues and form a lattice, a cracked veil of boulevards. smaller, 10 to the negative 5, 8 beats and an evil eye, traffic blows through ventricles of our hearts, silence, night. This is 10 to the negative 8, double helix. Two chains vibrate freely, as they might fly, moving at random with sound until they strike and rebound again and again. Each helix complicates, coils an architecture of attraction and resistance. Come here. Go away. Come here. Go away. This is called traces. Ten to the negative nine traces. The code answers the mystery of it all. Genetics. Twenty-six here. Twenty-seven there. Our links are weighed by these genetic hierarchies, not by greed, not by fear, 
not good versus bad. On the high wire to the ethereal builds a code, material to the immaterial, answers the mysteries, some with features belonging to, and those with traces separated from one another. And this poem is a favorite. Um, this is 10 to the negative 16. This is called Hands. Hands. My mother's hands made holy bread on holy Saturday. Her skin glistened from breaking open two dozen eggs, ten cups of milk, two cakes of yeast. The bread had a scent all its own, a spiritual feast. Malep, the pit of sweet cherries grown in the Ionian regions. Food can be spirit, bread can be life. The hands which made that bread also pulled us from their wombs, birthed, slick with sense of earthly matters. We forget all we might have known of the other worldly matters. Yet here, it all comes back to me now, instantly, speedily, this is peace. For what it is, it is sentience. And I think I would just read the title poem. I want to thank you all. Um, we do have copies of the book. And uh, I'm going to read zero. So now we're back at the World Trade Center. Zero. A raspberry snow cone on a hot day at a sandy beach a red tricycle, a red fire truck, a slammed knee, a band-aid, a mother caress, wave goodbye, snow cone gone.